David Foster Wallace said that fiction writers were born lurkers. We are those weirdos. And today we are going to hear Wallace talk at length about how writers are almost predatory in regards to how they handle human relations. And then he's going to give us some advice on how we should relate to the world as fiction writers and what we should be really looking for to bring to our fiction. Because 12 years ago, when I first started reading David Foster Wallace, I thought the most important things to look out for were all the overt things in society, like the crazy th- crazy things, the crazy people. But most of the time, those never translate very well to fiction. But the things that really matter are the overt things, the things we look over. I remember a David Foster Wallace story where he's writing about one of those dudes that stands in a bathroom all day and like hands out toiletries to people at some you know upscale hotel. And I've been to plenty of concerts in Las Vegas where those guys are there. And I've overlooked them time and time again. But that is a subject of a great short story. And if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to David Foster Wallace and great literature here on YouTube. So go check out the playlist down below for more videos on Wallace. Or if you're interested in other authors, I have over 400 videos on this channel just like this. And now let us sit excuse me, let us hop into the quote from Wallace. Fiction writers tend to be oglers. They tend to lurk and to stare. They are born watchers. They are the ones on the subway about whose nonchalant stare. There is something creepy somehow, almost predatory. This is because human situations are writer's food. Fiction writers watch other humans sort of the way gapers slow down for the car wrecks. They covet a vision of themselves as witnesses. And then continuing, David Foster Wallace responds to the quote that he just said. So, Quote again, this is not particularly new. There is the anecdote about all Jane Austen's friends being terrified to talk around her because they knew they would end up in a book. I'm not sure how fiction and poetry work, but part of it is that we really notice a lot more than we notice we notice. A particular job of fiction is not so much to note things for people, but rather to wake readers up to how observant they already are. And that's why for me as a reader, the descriptions or just toss-offs that I like the most are not the ones that seem utterly new, but the ones that have that eerie, good lord, I've noticed that too, but never even have taken a moment to articulate to myself. It depends on whether it is based on something real and what the purpose is. The culture since the mid-1970s and early 80s has become much more conscious of the phenomenon of watching and the arrangements between performers and audiences. While there is nothing different in this act of watching, I think public behavior now is watching. I think public behavior now is much more conscious of being watched. And there's an element of display that changes the equation between the watcher and the watch, eliminating the last bits of voyeurism that used to be attached to aesthetic watching. And if you guys want actually kind of a cool essay on this, that's a classic that came out in 1975, which I think Wallace may be referring to, but really shifted the tide. There is an essay. I'll put a link down in the description below. It's about eight pages. And it's called Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. And if you've read it before, comment down below what you thought. It's by a lady named Laura Mulvey. And really introduced the idea of of the female gaze or the male gaze on the females and different ideas about the cinema and brought psychoanalytic thought into it. And it's really good stuff. We'll talk about that deeper on a different video. It deserves its its own. But what's so funny about being a writer today, like Jane Austen's friends are like, oh my God, you're going to like take what I'm saying. But I've actually never experienced that. I've probably told thousands of people I'm a writer and no one's ever been like, are you going to take what I'm saying? Are you going to take my life? But I've heard, I'm, su- I'm sure you've heard this too, like countless times someone says, I have a degree in psychology and someone's like, oh, does that mean you could read my mind? Like people are so dumb and that's so annoying because like any basic girl out there can get, I mean, you know, so many basic people have degrees in psychology and have learned nothing and, and you don't even learn psychoanalytical thought anymore. You don't even le- really learn cognitive behavioral therapy at a deep level in an under- undergraduate program for psychology. It's, that's an absolutely joke of a degree, especially at the undergrad level. But it's surprising that people don't think that I'm constantly watching and constantly stealing from their lives. And so here's a personal example of something I've used that's a little bit, and this happened this year, it's something I'm working on right now that's a little bit more covert that a lot of people should be noticing. So I am a high school public school teacher. And of course, you know, I have jock students and nothing has changed in schools. I don't know, maybe in San Francisco it has, but the jocks still rule the school and think they're better than everybody else. And I have this one student though, and every time he takes his water bottle and unscrews it, he kind of gives us this little lick. He's like, ah, he does this weird things with, he does this weird thing with his water bottle before he drinks it. It's very subtle. 
But he kind of uh, sat near my desk for part of the year, and I would notice it. And when I caught on, I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, what kind of traumatic, weird stuff is going on here? And so I could notice in the room in that same class all the kids saying things and being inappropriate and all the wild stories that happen. But none of that's interesting. What's interesting is if I look at this guy, and now I've transformed it to a story about a man who's obsessed with licking other people's water bottle rims. I don't know if it's going to be a successful story or what's going to happen with it, but it's because I'm constantly watching and getting prepared for these kind of weird encounters, and they happen all the time. And um, a, an author, I, I've been to so many different workshops from authors because Las Vegas used to bring in all these authors. Um, the city of Las Vegas and the university I went to, we would have so many good authors coming in every year. But one of the cooler ones I ever met, and this is Ian at like maybe 21 years old, is Patricia Smith. And she's a native of New Orleans. And if you guys want to see a book about Katrina, a great poetry book that really shows kind of the negative aspects of Katrina. I mean, it made me cry. It still makes me cry. It was, it's a really good book. Um, I would go check out this book, Blood Dazzler. Check, get it from the library. Get it online wherever you can find it. Um, and it could kind of give you a renewed idea of Katrina because I think it happened in 2004? No, 2005. And so I was only 12 years old during that time. And so I really didn't understand at a deep level what was really going on. So if you really want to look back and look at Katrina, this is a great way to do it in a literary way. But what I remember her saying at her workshop, and this isn't new information, but that she would try to get a couple pages of notes a day. Yes, she said a day because you go out at least once a day of observations of what people are saying, of kind of the slang of, of the culture at the time or just settings and little things and she would just say get whatever you can down and I've not really done that at a deep level I've not really followed that protocol but it's something I've realized like okay this is what good writers do they are observing because when you read her book Blood Dazzler you see all, there are so many different angles of Katrina and so many different elements that she would have had to talk to a lot of people but her it's kind of like working your imagination as you're thinking and observing it's it's a skill and when you get enough, they're all synapses and you can all, or, you know, they're all these, you know, crazy divergent thoughts that you can synapse together when you need to. And if you are especially kind of a regional writer or a local writer, like I mostly write about the desert, you know, over 90% of the stuff I'm doing is related to the desert and desert people, desert culture is somewhat very similar, especially in the Southwest, you know, Southwestern United States. And so as I build up these thoughts and these uh, synapses and these profiles of people, it becomes a strength. It becomes something that I have, even if I'm not as good of a writer, let's say than someone else who writes about the desert, I can get away with a lot more and pack a punch because I have all this information that someone else isn't going to be able to get just in their own imagination or just coming and looking around for a couple weeks. Another word I like that Wallace used in that quote is he said gaper. Anybody ever heard that word before? Gaper? I know that word from skiing where every single uh, one day a year, everyone dresses up like you're kind of like a old person or someone who doesn't know what they're doing. And you put on the straight skis, the rental skis, and you go around and ski weird. And it's a super fun time. You get super drunk or whatever. Last year, I was actually at Jackson Hole's Gaper Day, which was really wild. because That's where my, uh, my parents live up in Wyoming. I've never heard it used really outside the ski context before. So I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, and so the next question, let's get Patricia out of here. Probably doesn't want to be associated with this channel. Uh, but is it ethical to lurk? Is it ethical to be looking all the time and trying to extract from people? And Wallace makes a great point that in the 70s and the 80s, that fourth wall was finally broken. The wall between the performer and the viewer was broken. And now with social media and now even just witnessing people um, filming for social media while you're out in public, you are watching people who are going to be watched by hundreds, if not thousands of people later on. It starts to get really weird. And so Pete, we've almost now come into this society where it's okay. You can consent, you know, everyone's almost consented to being watched. And this has larger, larger implications because for fiction writers, that's great. Like, hell yeah, man, we can kind of watch people and get stuff. And it's like, not necessarily as weird as maybe it was during a different time, because that's what everyone's doing. Everyone's trying to put on this prop and th this display and have this status. And now with everyone with the green hair and everything, people are peacocking. Everyone wants to be looked at. Okay. But one of the worst parts of society now, in my humble opinion, is that everyone is a rat. Everyone is a watcher. We don't necessarily need a police department because everyone will call the police for any incident, even if it's not unethical. Like I remember in Utah, so many different people. Um, I was in a dorm room in Utah. God, worst decision of my life. If there was any hint 
that there was a party going on or people were drinking or any marijuana smell, um, all the kids in the, you know, all the religious people would call the police immediately and there, we'd begin swatted. I mean, it happened so many times, like, oh my God. And it would happen to your room. If they smelled it and it wasn't your room, they would come and do all the rooms. And this would happen at least every other week. And this, you know, would happen out in public too. If someone was suspecting you, they'd look all weird at you. I've had the, had the police called on me multiple times in Utah by all these super judgmental people who were just on watch. And I wasn't doing anything. Well, maybe I was doing illegal things, but I wasn't doing anything that was harming them or harming anyone else's property and this really got exemplified obviously during covid where everyone was just watching and policing each other at this very deep level even to the extent of saying i won't hang out with you unless you did this medical thing and i got into so many arguments because i i just told myself you know what i don't care what my city says i'm just gonna walk into stores and shop and if they want me to leave they'll ask me to leave and i'll go somewhere else and i'll find someone who just lets me come in and shop like it's a normal day and eventually i did but in these Stores where apparently the management and no one else cared what I was doing, just going about my day, about wearing the uniform. They would, people would come up to me and start yelling at me. I was like, this isn't your store. This isn't your problem. Um, you should go shop somewhere else. You should go shop somewhere else. Why are you policing me? They're like, and I've had, they threatened to call the police. Oh, I'm going to call the police. That's illegal. I was like, do you think I care? But I'm like, holy hell, people got policed into thinking that they had to do certain things. I had so many friends out there who would sit and complain on Facebook all day. Oh my God, you know, I don't want to wear a mask, this and that. This is so and so unethical. And I was like, okay, then just don't wear one, bro. So simple. Just put your headphones on, walk in, and if someone throws you out, they throw you out. But they wouldn't do it. They'd sit and complain like cowards. And I don't care what you did. If you wanted to wear one, fine. If you don't want to wear one, that's fine. But if you want to complain about having to wear one, then still wearing one, even when there's other people doing, you know, not wearing a mask and not you know, really receiving any consequences, then that just makes you silly or it really makes you a coward. And I knew so many people who were doing that. And if everyone started doing that who was scared, then we, the, the, um, everything would have been shifted automatically. The businesses would have had to comply and the whole country would have been turned around and none of it would have been a problem if the 50% of people who were like, oh, I don't really want to do this actually didn't do it. But what were we scared of? We weren't scared of the police because you could have left. The police would have taken a lot. Like, oh, okay, we'll be there in a couple minutes. Like that's not some emergency call. And if everybody was doing it, they wouldn't have be able to handle the amount of volume. And so what was everyone really scared of? They were scared of other people watching them. They were scared of the gaze, the scared, you know, scared of what that sad status would mean. And that I really think was built into us by social media. And that's why the whole COVID thing is very interesting in relation to social media is that we've been primed to care what, you know, so many people were primed to care what other people think. And then I knew so many people who went against their own ethics, went against what they wanted to do and what they believed. And so many people who also got very nasty online, you know, attacking others. And it was shocking to see all these people. I was like, dude, turn the news off, you know, just relax. You know, don't, you guys are getting hyped up anyway. So I really think that, you know, that really exemplified and really showed how much this idea of watching and observation and policing others really became a major thing in American society and, and global society. And now with the advent of the smartphone and being able to film immediately, it's really weird because there could be something negative going on. I mean, this reminds me of the Harlan Ellison story at the start of the Death Bird story. It says, you know, there's a girl who's getting um, raped or stabbed at the bottom of this apartment complex in New York City, and everyone turns their lights on in the windows. Everyone, All the windows are on in this apartment complex, and in the courtyard, this lady's getting stabbed, and everyone's just watching in their windows, horrified, and then turns off their lights and doesn't do anything. And that's the same with like, um, as a school teacher fights now, like there are two people fighting who everyone is friends with and no one wants. I don't want to see anyone get hurt. They don't want to see, I'm sure they, I don't know if they want the best for their friends or people that they know, but I want the best for everyone. I don't want to see anyone hurt or having to fight, especially in school over some bullshit where they could hit their head on the desk or like something crazy could happen. You know, it's not really a, a sanctioned combat event, even like after school in a specific place. Like it's just happening randomly and that's that could be dangerous. And everyone just pulls out their phone and films and laughs about it and no one helps anyone. Anymore. And the same thing like with people dying on the street or car accidents. Like there are there have been times where someone needed help and people just walked by. And this person wasn't a homeless person or ODing on heroin. They were just a normal everyday citizen. And I don't know how I would feel if I was in trouble or if I was going through something and how many people would start filming me if let's say, you know, something crazy happened and I needed help. There would be a, a majority, not maybe a majority, but there would be a group of people who would just sit and film me. And that is a simulacra. That is a fake 
version of what's actually happening because experiencing something in the moment and seeing it, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. You get to see the movie. You get to see the fight in class. You should. You don't need to see it again. You don't need to be thinking about others because that's what happens. If you are thinking, I need to pull my phone out. You're not thinking about it for you. You're thinking, I got to show everyone. I get to be the person with the film. I get to post it online. You should be in the moment being like, okay, who rots? Coliseum. And the other thing about being watchers is we're not doers anymore. You know, here I am. I'm like calling for I'm like, guys, we need more. Con this channel is called Right Conscious. I need you guys to be conscious writers. I'm trying to start a movement here. This is why I'm waking up early. So I'm not doing other things on YouTube. I need 50,000 David Foster Wallace's or Cormac McCarthy's by the time I'm dead. If we want to see any progress in the literary movement. There's been some diss videos on me lately and, and on this channel of people saying, oh, right, Conscious, he just cares. He just is uh, promoting white dead authors and he doesn't care about uh, diversity and he doesn't recognize all the great authors. That, and, and, you know, shut down, sit the fuck down, like sit the fuck down, everybody. I've read all the new authors and some are good, but none of them are touching the greats. Like everyone, like... And it's not, a, it's not a coincidence that the people who are saying that are programmed politically to one side. And I think that I disagree with both sides politically in terms of how they've been programmed in the mainstream media. But, you know, that's one of been kind of been one of the complaints that other booktube channels are throwing at me lately. And what I and I'm like, you guys are crazy. Percival Everett couldn't couldn't hold Cormac McCarthy's jockstrap in a paragraph. His best paragraph couldn't touch Cormac McCarthy's worst paragraph. Honestly, Zadie Smith, uh, Colson Whitehead, sit, sit, sit the fuck down, you guys. Like, are you kidding me? You're gonna try to shove that down my throat? You're gonna? Sh I, I'm not saying they're not good. They're good. Sometimes they're great. But are they legendary? Are they the best? Did they actually sit and put the work in? Because you you maybe think that this channel is just about these two authors or white authors. No, I see the lists over there, and there's authors from every single race, every single gender, every single um. You know, there's gay people. I see a whole different list of people I'm talking about. These are the two I'm talking about right now. But none of that list right now, at least the ones that I see, are currently writing right now. Like I said, there are some great authors out there. And I've explained many times on this channel before what happened, why authors aren't as good anymore. And these people want me to be like the Disney channel. They want me to have like, you get to talk about David Foster Wallace and Cormac 40% of the time. But then you have to talk about um, Colson Whitehead 12% of the time and do this 10% of the time. And you have to have at least half half women on the show. And so do you, not, you guys not realize this is independent publishing? This is, you can't control me. I can do whatever I want. And if you want to slander me, like you guys are crazy. Say I'm racist, sexist, like the craziest things. And it's because everyone is a bunch of watchers now. People aren't doing, people aren't realizing in promoting the doers and doing in their own life. So they are like just degrading other people. It's crazy. And I, like I said, I take shots all the time. But back to my point, we need 50,000 doers. I don't need any, We. I love that you guys are watching. I want you to continue to watch. But we need writers and good writers at that. And we need a lot of them to actually make people care about reading again. Because the MFA programs, they're not going to help us. The publishing houses, they're not going to help us. We can only help ourselves. It's only going to happen through an independent movement. The Kindle writers are not going to help us. The best example I could think of is Cloud Rap, SoundCloud Rap. In like 2013, Young Lean came on and, you know, bitches come and go. Ha! Huh. You know, that song Jinsid Strip 2002, and it changed rap forever. SoundCloud rap blew up, and they transcended the whole music industry. And there's so many artists now um, who are rappers who are independent of labels and have made millions of dollars and transformed music and created really good stuff and, and beat off a lot of, you know, like guys like Drake and all these mainstream rappers getting pushed by the, by the industry. And that's what we can do. That is our example. The, the young Lean wasn't sitting there and, be, and being like on Kindle. Is there a spot for... Um, Zoe De Chanel rips in rap. Uh, he wasn't sitting there doing right to market or like I can make a lot of money doing erotica. He was just doing it. He was just doing art and saying, "Fuck the label. I'm gonna sit here and go independent and do this myself." And then he inspired tens of thousands of people to do it too. And tens of thousands of them have sucked. They're 99% of cloud rappers suck, but 1% of them are really good and they changed the entire in industry. And they're, because there are so many, there's probably hundreds of them now, they've created a movement and it's changed music forever. And now the mainstream rappers are copying them and using their playbook. That's what we have to do. It's already happened before. We have to have the balls to do it though. We are way too self-conscious. Young Lean uh, hanging out and singing his little song when he's 16 years old. He's not thinking about anything. He's not worried about the watchers. He's just putting art out there. The 
the Suicide Boys, who were um, addicted to heroin and selling furniture when they released 200 songs in a year and kicked, you know, and really ramped up cloud rap. They weren't thinking about anything. They weren't sitting there and like being intellectual and being like, this is my first novel. This is my first song. I have to make sure it's really good. Uh, they weren't doing that. Are you crazy? They, they transcended the industry. They transcended the viewers. And just like, we're going to put out the dopest music. And I don't care what people think. If you look at a lot of these guys' first concerts, um, like I said, the Suicide Boys are one of the biggest independent artists in the biggest independent artists in the world right now. Their first concerts, no one was showing up. It was just their parents. It was them and their parents at these concerts. And now they sell out stadiums. Eight years later, you know, nine years later or whatever. And so the same thing can happen. We could sell out. We can't sell out stadiums with our writing, but we can fill halls again. We can go on lecture tours. We can actually, you know, look at the example of Jordan Peterson. I've, been, I've dissed Jordan Peterson on the show before, but he showed the potential of someone who's independent, who doesn't really care, who just comes out there and put, starts putting out content, is a doer who isn't connected. And even though he's kind of moved to the Daily Wire and into Christianity, he still pushes back against conservatives and Christianity at times. He's not totally co-opted. And, and even though, you know, like I said, I have my disagreements with, disagreements with Jordan Peterson, but he showed the potential of what independence can do. And he goes on lecture tours now. That's not a one person thing. That's something that can be created. There can be a literary kind of renaissance. That's what I keep talking about, where we have more opportunities than just being famous on YouTube or just selling books on Kindle. It could extend much further and be much bigger, but we need the numbers because some of you guys out there suck. Maybe I suck. Maybe that, you know, we don't know, but until we have enough people, until we have uh, enough booktubers and enough writers and enough um, people doing other things and, you know, uh, you know, agents and stuff all functioning within a similar bubble, then we're not going to know who sucks and who's the best because I already know that if we have nobody doing this, then I'm not probably the one. I'm, you know, there are probably people, way, you, probably you, maybe someone out there who's way better at BookTube than me and you'll do way better and get millions of views. And there's writers out there who will do that, but we need numbers and we have to have a con, we have, and the core of that though is conscious writing. It's not any of this nihilistic bullshit. We need to lift people up. We need to move away from the artiste manquet and the suffering artist programming that's been shoved down our throats. We don't need that anymore. That can be, uh, it, it, we can have tragedies. We can have that. But our mentality and what we're doing needs to uplift people. We need to show people that transformation is possible through literature and in our own lives. We can't be these reclusive hiding away people anymore. That game's over. It didn't work. And if it did work, it impacted the world a long time ago. But we have to be in people's faces and getting them back into books because just showing someone a book, I could tell someone, this book's the greatest book of all time. All the Pretty Horses is the best thing you're ever going to read. And no one, no one cares. Nobody cares. And so we need more than that. I need you guys to put something out there that's going to make people want to read. And you're going to have to tell people you have to read this. And this is why it matters. It's like book books now. It's like, I feel like I'm in some like back room. I'm like, hey dog, like I know you're really busy with your wife and your kids and all these different things. And I know you don't have that much time anymore, but like, bro, you should really check out this book. It's like, I, it shouldn't be like that. It's like, no, dude, you need to, I, we need to speak confidently about these things and not be seen like elitists and weirdos. And it's only like that right now because the anti-intellectuals are winning because they have the numbers. All right, so- we cannot be watchers. We have to start becoming doers. We cannot fall into this. We need to watch to get our content, but we cannot fall into the society of watching. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for supporting great literature and authors and still buying books, still thinking about it, going to the library, talking to people about it. And I will see you guys in the next video.